Molt bé, doncs, bona tarda. No, bon dia. Perdoneu. Doncs, com els deia, bon dia i agraïts per la seva presència. El... El motiu de la compareixença de premsa del president Carter, del senyor Robert de Ventós, president executiu del Premi Internacional de Catalunya, i de mi mateix és presentar a vostès el guardonat, que òbviament no cal que el presentem, i explicar algunes de les particularitats del Premi Internacional de Catalunya d'enguany, i també transmetre'ls a vostès davant del president Carter, el nostre agraïment per l'acceptació del guardó per l'extraordinària cordialitat, president Carter, en què s'han produït tots els contactes amb vostè des que el jurat va posar el seu nom sobre la taula i per agrair-li molt especialment la delicadesa i les atencions que ens ha manifestat vostè mateix i la seva família en aquests dies que estem compartint amb vostès aquí a Catalunya. I transmetre-li, president Carter, la felicitació i la salutació del president de la Generalitat, que aquest matí no ha pogut estar aquí al Palau, perquè, com sap, com li he pogut explicar, hi ha compareixença parlamentària i tindran ocasió de veure'ns aquesta tarda abans de l'acte institucional d'entrega del guardó. El president Jimmy Carter, que és el Premi Internacional de Catalunya 2010, ha vingut a Barcelona acompanyat de la seva esposa Rosalind, bon dia, i dels seus fills i esposes, Xep, en Becky, i Jeff i Anet. Com els deia, ha estat uns quants dies aquí a Barcelona i ahir vam tenir un acte a la Pedrera amb un diàleg amb el senyor Javier Solana, que president ens va semblar extraordinàriament suggerent i molt interessant els que vam tenir el plaer d'escoltar-los a vostè i a l'amic Javier Solana. Com vostès saben, el Premi Internacional de Catalunya, atorgat per la Generalitat i dotat en 100.000 euros i l'escultura cedida en el seu moment per l'Antoni Tàpies, es concedeix cada any a les persones que han contribuït a judici del jurat a impulsar amb el seu treball creador el desenvolupament dels valors culturals, científics o humans arreu del món. El Premi Internacional de Catalunya ja té un llistó molt alt, són persones molt rellevants les que han obtingut el guardó, Carl Poppel, Custó, Edgar Moreng, Jacques Delors, i els darrers anys l'han rebut l'any 2004 el filòsof palestí Sari Nuseibé i conjuntament amb l'escriptor israelià Amos Oz. L'any 2005 l'antropòleg francès Claude Lévi-Strauss. L'any 2006 el bisbe brasiler català Pere Casaldàliga. L'any 2007 un compatriota seu, president Carter, el biòleg Edward Wilson. L'any 2008 les birmanes Cynthia Maung i la dirigent política Sant Suquí i l'any passat un altre compatriota seu el videoartista Bill Viola El jurat aquest any ha comptat amb algunes incorporacions noves s'han incorporat al jurat el senyor Jacques Delors el senyor Richard Richardsenet i la senyora Anna Veiga que han substituït a la senyora Núria Espert, al senyor Casuo Goura i al senyor Baltasar Porcel, que fa justament un any ens ha deixat i que ha estat durant molts i molts anys vinculat al Premi Internacional Catalunya com a president executiu d'aquest mateix premi. Faig avinent també que 
l'ambaixadora de Jordània a Itàlia, la princesa Alhacemi, ens acompanya avui aquí. Bon dia, també. Una de les membres del jurat més actives i que no se'n perd una. Sempre que la demanem que ens acompanyi, sempre tenim el goig de comptar amb la seva col·laboració. El professor Xavier Robert de Ventós els farà una glosa inicial de les raons per les quals el jurat de la Premi Catalunya ha atribuït aquest guardó al president Carter i seguidament cedirem la paraula al president Carter i a vostès mateixos. Xavier? Bé, jo em sembla que tinc que parlar molt poc perquè aquesta tarda presentaré en nom del jurat, no només en nom meu, sinó en nom del jurat, les raons del premi. Podria resumir-ho d'una certa manera. Abans vull donar la benvinguda al professor ambaixador Amler Moss de l'equip del president Carter, ambaixador al Panamà i la princesa que ens ajuda en cada ocasió. Mirin, per dir-ho d'una manera, no sé si políticament molt correcta, però des que el president Carter no és molt correcte, jo em permetré posar una imatge que també és poc correcta. Mirin, el resum, el fons, jo em tarannà en el jurat de donar el premi al president Carter donant la volta a una certa imatge que deliberadament o no s'havia creat entorn d'ell. Tots vostès saben que una manera de desqualificar una a una persona, a una persona, per dir, a una persona molt guapa, una dona molt guapa, un home molt guapo. I dius, oi, quina dona tan guapa. Dius, sí, té el cabell bonic. Sí, té les mans boniques. Que és una manera de desqualificar indirectament. Doncs bé, jo havia trobat que el president Carter, admirat per la seva obra i per els seus llibres, perquè també és un gran autor, amb un gran sentit de la ironia, jo dic, el president Carter... Doncs sí, quin bon expresident. I aquest jurat va voler donar el premi al president Carter. No l'obro, òbviament, no es pot negar la importància del Carter sent del centre que diria que ha creat i dirigeix i en mereix una admiració per part de tots. Però hi ha una obra política i una confrontació amb problemes econòmics que avui estan renaixent una confrontació amb una certa opinió pública americana que necessitava vaselina egoista, egotista, i necessitava sentir que el país era poderós i musculós, i cedir i negociar en aquell moment, semblava que era una cosa de gallines. Aquestes consideracions crec que calia donar-los la volta i explicar la sabidoria i coratge polític que es van representar prendre decisions econòmiques molt dures abans de les eleccions és la situació també que ens trobem nosaltres a Catalunya ara i a Espanya ara, que s'han de prendre decisions polítiques, econòmiques, no precisament populars i que el que es pot fer és dissimular o enfrontar-ho. El president Carter, jo crec, va tenir un gran coratge en enfrontar tant una opinió pública neoliberal musculosa com una situació preelectoral musculosa en la que es podia fer demagògia i va decidir treballar pel bé dels Estats Units. Això jo en parlaré aquesta tarda, em sembla que és la millor ocasió que vostès mateixos puguin preguntar-li a ell. Ja que el tenim aquí, aprofitem-lo. Hi preguntes o no? aprofitant que la seva visita coincideix a Catalunya amb uns moments polítics delicats, que s'ha conegut la sentència de l'Estatut, no sé si coneix aquesta situació. Voldria saber ell que va rebre el Premi Nobel de la Pau i com a gran mediador polític, quin consell podria donar al govern de Catalunya en aquests moments que el Tribunal Constitucional ha sentenciat retallant l'Estatut català, la norma clau a Catalunya si pot donar algun consell, si coneix aquesta situació i si podria donar algun consell. 
Well, I, um, I do know about the decision. <clears throat> After four years, the Constitutional Court ruled, and I have to equate it or parallel it with uh, the situation in my own country. Uh, we have now a Supreme Court that in the last uh, year has made some very uh, erroneous decisions uh, concerning the financing of political campaigns, concerning the possession of weapons in our, my country, <clears throat> and other issues. So um, my own uh, only advice would be that the Catalonian people have to be patient and realize that um, no matter what the courts rule, it is very likely that we'll still see the unique character of Catalonian um, social and economic and cultural and political life and language perpetuated and admired for the next thousand years. So this is a temporary aberration uh, in the decision of the relationship between Catalonia and the rest of Spain. And uh, I think that the Catalonian people uh, have to acknowledge the decision of the Constitutional Court now. I know that it has caused anguish, particularly among some of the political leaders, but uh, my advice would be just one word, patience, and a uh, confidence that there is no way that a court can uh, modify dramatically or in a derogatory way the basic culture and commitment and heritage of the Catalonian people. <coughs> Mr. Carter, here. Yes. Uh, following Mr. Xavier's thesis <coughs> that you were actually a good president, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what would have been your main priorities if, if you had had a second term as president, both in domestic and foreign policy? Well, domestically and foreign policy, I would have maintained my commitment to the exaltation of human rights. Uh, in my own country and around the world. <laughs> this was a commitment that I made when I went into office and that I adhered to for four full years. Uh, we promoted human rights in every embassy of my country, including Panama, where Amber Moss, next to you, served. One of the basic human rights I felt was to treat the Panamanian people with respect and with dignity and with justice. And one of the greatest challenges I had was to turn over the Panama Canal Zone to the Panamanian people. That was an element of human rights. Another one was to promote democracy and freedom uh, throughout my own hemisphere. Uh, when I became president, almost all of the uh, countries in South America were dictatorships, military dictatorships. Uh, within a few, few years, partially because of my human rights policy, they, they have all become democracies. And now. All the countries in South America are democratic countries. Uh, another commitment that we made was to peace, not only for my own country, but for others around the world. Uh, when I was <coughs> served as four years, four years, we had the very great challenges to my country, militarily and economically and politically. Uh, but I was able to go through four years without launching a missile, without dropping a bomb, without firing a bullet. And we also promoted uh, my own country's security uh, in dealing with other countries. Uh, we also reached out to establish diplomatic relationships that have had a profound effect, not only in my country, but also around the world. And that is the establishment of full diplomatic relations between the United States and China, which had been the other way for 35 years. And I think this uh, was parallel with uh, Deng Xiaoping, the premier of uh, China, declaring that China would then be an open, a more open society and would reach out to the rest of the world. This was a change made simultaneously with my decision to normalize diplomatic relations with China. And, and we, I'll, I'll just have one more addition. We had observed <coughs> that in the 25 years before I became president, there had been four major wars in the Middle East between Israel and its Arab neighbors led on the Arab side by Egypt. So I negotiated a peace agreement between Israel and Egypt, a treaty, not a word of which has been violated now for more than 31 years. And at the time, we had commitment from Israel to give the Palestinians their own right, their own autonomy, and to withdraw Israeli uh, political and military forces from uh, Palestine. Unfortunately, when I went out of office, that commitment was uh, ignored 
by the Israelis and by the United States as well. And, and I don't think there's much doubt that if I had stayed in office for a longer period of time, uh, we could have perpetuated the commitments that were made for peace between Israel and the Palestinian, for Palestinian rights, and for peace in the Middle East. So uh, I have some regrets, but I've had a very good life after I left the White House, and uh, this exaltation by this award uh, is one of the happy moments that I've experienced since uh, the presidency. I'm sorry, my wife has some comments to make. No. <coughs> Hola, bon dia. La meva pregunta és relacionada amb la primera. Era si, si algun dia Escòcia o Catalunya, ara en aquesta sentència, doncs, decidíssim fer un referèndum d'independència, si la Fundació Carter estaria disposada a enviar-hi observadors internacionals, si fos el cas, per, per seguir aquest, aquest procés. Well, we have to make a decision on an individual basis, <coughs> depending on the circumstances at the time. And, <coughs> excuse me, if, um, if this should, should happen, and we would be invited in you know, by the appropriate authorities, I have to say both in Barcelona and also in Madrid, to uh, monitor the election to make sure it was safe and free and, uh, and honest and fair then the Carter Center would certainly uh, consider seriously coming here. It would be a pleasure to give me another chance to come back to uh, Catalonia, but also to uh, help with the assurance that the will of the Catalonian people will be expressed accurately. So the answer basically is yes, if, it, if the situation then would warrant uh, our participation. <coughs> we only go into places to help with elections if they are doubtful about the outcome, if there's a serious problem there. So that's another prerequisite. If there was a serious problem here and a doubt that the election could be held safely and freely without us, then we probably would not come. We've now participated in 78 troubled elections. And uh, to summarize, if we were asked in an appropriate way, the answer would be yes, we would come. None. Uh, what's your advice to President Obama in two uh, key issues in the Middle East? Uh, first one, Iran, and then the relationship with Israel and Benjamin Netanyahu government. Well, my, my, I give him my advice on occasion and uh, to his advisors as well. I spoke just uh, last week to Senator Mitchell, who is his envoy to the Middle East. Uh, my strong advice there is to pursue the uh, commitments that have already been made by the United States government, by Russia, by the European Union and the United Nations, the members of the so-called International Quartet, that Israel should withdraw from the occupied territories, not only in Palestine, but also in Lebanon and Syria, so that Israel could have peace with its neighbors, mostly of whom are Arab. And also this is compatible with the Arab Peace Initiative, where all 23 uh, Arab uh, countries agreed that if Israel would withdraw to its 1967 borders with some negotiated modifications and exchange of, of, of territory, then all the Arab countries would recognize Israel's right to exist, to live in peace, and have full normal diplomatic relations and trade relationships with Israel. So that's my advice to President Obama is to pursue that aggressively, even though it might be uh, uncomfortable for the present Netanyahu government. My um, Concern is that with its presently constituted uh, coalition, including uh, Shas and the party of Lieberman, that Netanyahu is not free to make that kind of decision. So it may be in the future, in the next months or years, that the government would change its coalition partners. And maybe if uh, Netanyahu even stayed as prime minister, if he had a partnership with, say, Kadima, and, uh, and the Labor Party continued, then they could get a majority to support um, a, a peace agreement. That's my hope and expectation. Uh, uh, concerning Iran, uh, when the Shah was deposed and left uh, Iran, and the Ayatollah Khomeini established a revolutionary government, <coughs> I very quickly established full diplomatic relations with the new government. 
As a matter of fact, I sent diplomats, as you may remember, to Tehran. They sent diplomats to uh, Washington. And uh, the revolutionary uh, forces uh, captured my diplomats in Tehran and held them for a long period of time, which was a very, obviously, painful and dif difficult for me. But uh, after that crisis was over, uh, the, the hostages were all released the last few hours I was in office. Uh, then I think that after that, uh, I would hope that the United States could have established diplomatic relations again with Iran to have full conversations and communications with the government in Tehran. And uh, I think that that would be uh, advisable now to have as, as much relationship with the uh, Tehran leaders as possible. And also to, put, to stop the constant threat that sometimes comes from Washington and continually comes from Tel Aviv that Iran is going to be attacked, uh, even by possibly nuclear weapons. I think this threat of attack probably uh, stimulates some of the doubtful people in the Iranian leadership to proceed with their own nuclear plans. So I think it's very advisable for the United States and the European community, including uh, hopefully China and Russia, to continue to put pressure on Iran not to go toward uh, the ownership of a nuclear arsenal. That's a very high priority. But I think negotiations and the end of the threats to Iran would be two factors that might bring this into real reality. Good day, Mr. Carter. I would like to ask you, because you have been talking a little bit about the premium that you have today. On Dissabte, in the morning, you went to the city of Terrassa to inaugurate a church, a protestant church. I would like to ask you, En primer lloc, si ha sigut molt complicat encabir aquesta visita dins de la seva agenda i que em fes un comentari una mica de l'acte que l'espera dissabte al matí. Gràcies. Well, I was invited to come there to participate in a ceremony. I think your vice president will also be there for the ceremonies. And this is a new Protestant church. I happen to be a Protestant myself. So when I travel around the world, I am always uh, friendly toward and try to accommodate the invitations that I receive from others who share my own faith. And so I'll be looking forward to that. I'll be making some comments, which I haven't yet prepared, uh, at the ceremony uh, dealing with the teachings of Jesus Christ, uh, whom I worship. Uh, my wife and I attend a small church in our village, and, and I teach Bible lessons uh, every Sunday that I'm home. <clears throat> but I'll be talking about um, how the teachings of Jesus uh, more than 2,000 years ago are still applicable to the interrelationship among people in the current uh, era and how there's no incompatibility basically between the uh, enlightened political policies of, uh, of leaders and our basic Christian faith since Christ espoused peace. Uh, we worship the Prince of Peace. And uh, Jesus also espoused uh, justice and uh, humility and service, the alleviation of suffering, things of that kind. So uh, that um, is all the ties that um, I think are compatible between a political life and also a religious life. Those are the kind of things that I'll probably be mentioning there. <coughs> I was honored to be asked and glad that we could accommodate this on our itinerary. <coughs> Bon dia, senyor Carter. Uh, la meva pregunta voldria demanar la seva opinió respecte a uh, si ha tingut coneixement del que de l'actitud que està tenint el govern de Marroc des del mes de març amb l'expulsió de gairebé més de 100 cooperants internacionals, especialment són de confessió protestant. Ahí rebíem a casa nostra a Barcelona la darrera expulsió, que era una catalana expulsada el divendres sense cap mena de dret de defensa. I voldria saber la seva opinió respecte a això i també que els Estats Units han estat els únics que han exercit una pressió important, donat que són els únics que han aconseguit que no hi haguessin més expulsions des del passat divendres. I voldria saber la seva opinió. I have to admit I'm not familiar with that situation, but uh, just in general terms without being familiar with it, uh, I don't um, approve of the expulsion of people if they are uh, committed to humanitarian uh, goals and projects. Uh, and if you, you said that the United States uh, objected to the expulsion, 
And then I think this is one of the wise decisions that the government of uh, Obama have made. But I'm sorry that I, I can't comment from a knowledge of the situation. Alguna pregunta més? Per la banda de les ràdios, que no sé si els veig a tots. Alguna pregunta més? No. Molt bé. Doncs, si no hi ha cap altra pregunta, moltes gràcies, president Carter, i moltes gràcies a la seva família i a tots vostès. Jo voldria recordar que avui, fa un any, dia per dia, va morir Baltasar Porcel, que va ser el creador, inventor d'aquest premi, i crec que podem parlar i fer-li homenatge en aquest sentit. El recordem. I és el que li va donar la línia, perquè si veuen vostès els primers premis que vam tenir, és el que va marcar la línia que després el primer ja seguí. Per tant, no és només un recordatori del passat, sinó que és un testimoni del present i de com ha anat el premi. Amb la Teresa Sala, que és la que ha ajuntat el període primer amb el període segon, i és l'única que ho sap tot. Si voleu saber alguna cosa, pregunteu-li. Molt bé, gràcies i bon dia. Thank you. Thank you. The Right Honorable Jose Montilla, President of uh, La Ditat of Catalonia, members of the Catalan government, members of the jury of the Premi Internacional Catalunya 2010, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, also, I noticed that the U.S. Ambassador is here. I'm very grateful for that. And two other former presidents are here. It reminds me of um, a cartoon in the New York uh, magazine that explains the value of our lives these days. This little boy is looking up at his father, and he says, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be a former president. Well, we enjoy the life of a former president, and I'm very glad to be here tonight to uh, share with you the uh, values of our life. I'm very grateful for this honor, because the past winners of the award and the composition of a jury also reflect the spirit and values to which the Carter Center is also dedicated. The words of a citation tell us that the people of Catalonia identify closely with the causes of peace and human rights. With colleagues at our center, my wife and I try to improve the lives of the most underprivileged peoples of the world. We see this prize as a vote of confidence in a way in what we are doing. De tot cor, moltes gràcies. Let me reciprocate this welcome to your wonderful city of Barcelona by inviting all of you to visit the Carter Center in Atlanta in hopes that you join us in striving for a world in which every person can enjoy good health and live in peace. Barcelona and Atlanta were both Olympic cities in the 1990s, and I see all around me the great accomplishments of your Olympic mayor and later president of a Generalitat, Pascual Maragall. The games were historically important to both our cities and were an excellent opportunity to learn about each other. My family and I are not strangers to Spain or to Catalonia. We love to travel around the country, to stay in Paradores, and to enjoy the diverse and friendly people. Our most recent visit included Barcelona, of course, and then a trip to Cardona, where we visited its uh, fortress and its castle. We stayed in its Parador. We explored its Salt Mountain and saw its first charter that was signed in the 10th century by Barcelona's Count Borrell Segundo II. It made us eager to return and to see more of Catalonia and now that hope has come true. I'm pleased to be learning, as I prepared for this event, about the ancient language and customs of Catalonia. Although American culture is much younger, we have a lot in common. We, we derive our strength from a heterogeneous population. I'm told that President Jordi Pujol 
described a, a Catalan very simply as someone who lives and works in Catalonia. We both absorb foreigners in our societies and our values and appreciate the cultures that they bring to us. As governor of the state of Georgia, I was very proud to help establish 10 international offices around the world to promote trade and investment. I didn't think anyone else could do as good, but I've learned that Catalonia has 35 such locations, with five of them in the United States. This entrepreneurial spirit is greatly needed in these hard economic times, and such efforts will be rewarded. We also share moments of um, history, traversed with, interspersed with tragedy. I'm told that September the 11th, a horrible day for my country in 2001, was even worse for Catalonia in 1714. But our peoples are resilient, and we know how to recover our strength and face the future with courage. We share a love for democracy and freedom. I was taught, I hate to admit, that the English Magna Carta of 1215 was the beginning of European democracy. For some reason, our students don't learn that many centuries earlier than that. Catalan institutions such as the Conseil de Cent equalize opportunity in society. And few of our law students know that the Consulate de Mar established maritime law in the Mediterranean. Ever since Spain returned to democracy, it has been a leader in European integration and a model for other countries, especially in Latin America, in making transitions to democratic rule. <clears throat> Referring again to September 11th, 2001, on that same day in Lima, Peru, the United States and other nations in the Americas signed the Inter-American Democratic Charter, proclaiming unanimously that democracy would be the only acceptable form of government in our hemisphere. The success of Spanish democracy has been imitated not just on paper, but in practice in most of these countries in Latin America. I recognize, of course, that democracy everywhere is still a work in progress, as I've seen in my own country during recent years. The ancient internationalist tradition of Catalonia has played an important role as the Barcelona process began in 1995 to strengthen cooperation among, I believe, 43 nations associated with the Mediterranean. It was natural for the new union for the Mediterranean to be located here in Barcelona in 2008. Still in its early stages, it has many challenges and opportunities. Let me now reflect on the United States of America and some changes I have seen in my own lifetime. In my country, we must never forget the gross injustices imposed on Native Americans during the 18th and the 19th centuries, and our 100 years of racial segregation that followed the abolition of slavery in 1865. Some of the damage of those years still afflicts my country to this day, but I am confident that a new administration in Washington, led by a black American, that we are beginning to leave these things behind us. I look back on America after World War II, when I was serving as a submarine officer in the United States Navy. We were even then a greater superpower than today, accounting for nearly one half the world's economy. And we're the only ar army still capable after the war of fighting another war. The United States could have acted almost unilaterally to accomplish its selfish purposes. We didn't do that. Instead, our political leaders of those days helped in the evolution of world governance through the United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. President Franklin Roosevelt's widow, Eleanor, chaired the commission that produced the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
one of the most inspired documents ever written. Our nation supported new instruments of international law, such as the Geneva Conventions that prohibit genocide and torture. My country also provided the Marshall Plan for the reconstruction of Europe, which was administered with collegiality and mutual respect. The post-war criminal trials of Nazis at Nuremberg were conducted expeditiously and met exemplary legal standards. No prisoners were tortured. No prisoners were denied competent defense counsel. No prisoners were held without charges. The idea of an international criminal court emerged from that day to be a logical successor to the Nuremberg Court. The Carter Center worked hard on this project, and now 111 states are parties to the ICC. The George W. Bush administration, which violated many basic principles of international justice, was conspicuously hostile to the court, and the United States is still not among the signatories. The Obama administration has signaled to me personally and to the public that it is more favorable to the ICC, and I hope for our participation in the future. During my presidency, I tried to recreate the internationalist spirit that I had known as a naval officer in my youth. I normalized diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China after 35 years of estrangement, and I emphasized the importance of human rights, both in communist countries and also in the right-wing di dictatorships that had often been favored by leaders in Washington. We negotiated and implemented, as has already been said, the Panama Canal Treaties, persuaded that this was in our country's best interest and also crucial to our relationship with other countries in Latin America. We negotiated the first peace treaty between Israel and an Arab neighbor, <coughs> Egypt, which is really Israel's only military opponent, armed by the Soviet Union at that time. Since that treaty was signed in 1979, not a single word of it has ever been violated. We concluded, as Ambler has said, a nuclear arms limitation treaty with the Soviets to reduce our arsenals. And I'm pleased to see that President Obama is following the same path. And he declared this in his first speech to the United Nations in September 2009. This is a right road for the United States and other nations to take to work towards zero nuclear weapons on Earth. As a military officer, I improved the technological superiority of our armed forces while utilizing strong and peaceful diplomacy to exploit Soviet vulnerabilities. I have cherished a plaque given to me as I left office with this quote from our third president, Thomas Jefferson, and I quote, I have the consolation to reflect that during the period of my administration, not a drop of blood of a single citizen was shed by the sword of war. Let me now turn to the work of the Carter Center, which has been the focal point of the lives of me and Rosen for the past 28 years. As some of you may know, when I left the U.S. presidency, Rosen and I founded the Carter Center. We gave it a global, a global focus with programs that meet the needs of the most de desperate and suffering people, filling vacuums without duplicating or competing with others. We now have programs in 73 nations on Earth, 35 of them, not coincidentally, are in Africa. Our mission is simple, to promote human rights and alleviate human suffering to prevent and resolve conflicts, enhance freedom and democracy, and improve health. The recent election that was held in Sudan was one of the most troubled ones that we have ever monitored. We reported many defects in that election, but the process was relatively peaceful and a necessary step toward fulfilling the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. We're still there and we were there for two years before that election in April. We'll be there until January of next year, 
when a referendum will be held in southern Sudan to decide, we hope, peacefully and honestly whether or not southern Sudan should become a new nation or remain a part of Sudan. It may surprise you more than that to know that we have worked for many years with the government of China in observing elections, free, open, honest, democratic elections in more than 600,000 small communities in China, wherein 75% of China's 1.3 billion people elect their own local leaders at the town and village level. Our center has, uh, has also had an active program in mediation and conflict resolution designed to fill the space between official peace efforts. We've had some notable successes. In 1994, one of our most interesting adventures was uh, to help resolve the nuclear crisis in North Korea, which threatened war in the Korean Peninsula. Rosen and I traveled to Pyongyang at the invitation of President Kim Il-sung, and we negotiated with him and concluded a complete agreement. All the terms of our negotiated agreement were adopted by the U.S. government, and this froze their, froze their nuclear adventures for eight years. Building on this agreement for negotiations between North and South Korea, the presence of those two countries pursued peaceful relations, which won a Nobel Peace Prize for South Korea's President Kim Dae-jung. Unfortunately, the policy of, government, of uh, President Bush branding North Korea as a part of the axis of evil and cutting off all direct talks or communications between the United States and North Korea produced the departure of that country from the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty and also the restarting of its plutonium program. And now they probably have enough enriched plutonium to produce maybe seven or eight nuclear weapons. Looking toward the Middle East, the Carter Center have full-time offices in Jerusalem, in the West Bank, in Ramallah, and also in Gaza. And we meet freely with all the parties that are involved in the future process of bringing peace to Israel and to its neighbors. We deal with Lebanon, we deal with Syria, and among the Palestinians, we deal freely with Hamas and also with Fatah. As you all may recall, uh, the Carter Center monitored the election in 2006, in January, when Hamas, in a free and fair election, won the election and the right to organize the government of Palestine. Unfortunately, after they won the election, they were declared to be terrorists and prohibited from holding office and even imprisoned by the Israelis because they had had the courage to seek election in a fair and honest contest. It's rewarding to know that President Obama is pursuing the same goal of bringing peace to Israel and his neighbors with patience, which is necessary, and also with persistence, which is necessary. The major part of our work at the Carter Center involves global health issues affecting the poorest of the poor, mostly in Africa. Our International Task Force for Disease Eradication the only one of its kind. Composed of scientists and notable health organizations, we monitor every human illness to identify those that might be completely eradicated from the whole earth or eliminated completely in an individual country. We will soon complete our work, for instance, on our first targeted disease called dracunculiasis, or guinea worm. We reduced already 3.6 million cases of guinea worm in more than 23,000 individual villages, down from 3.6 million just to 3,000, less than 3,000. And we'll soon see the last case of this terrible disease on the face of the earth. Mental health has been a particular interest of Rosalind, my wife, for more than 40 years as she attempts to remove the stigma from those with mental illness. Let me conclude my remarks by sharing with you my thoughts of some of the global opportunities that America faces today. 
I think often of the optimal role, the best role of a true global superpower. It should be that every person on earth faced with persecution by his own government would immediately say, I'll turn to Washington because the leaders there endorse and enforce all aspects of human rights. Someone desiring freedom and fair election should be able to say, quote, America is the epitome of democracy, setting an example for the world to follow. Those involved in civil war or conflict with a neighbor would automatically say, I can follow the example of the United States of America, which refrains from armed conflict and elevates peace to the top position and military combat, combat only as a last resort. Also, a true superpower would be in the forefront of every effort to protect the environment, leading all other nations in preventing the impending disaster of global warming. There should be a condemnation by the world's superpower of any economic sanctions imposed on a people that are already suffering under a despotic leadership whose policies are condemned politically. And I think finally, the most powerful nation on earth should be the most generous in overcoming an increasingly serious challenge, perhaps the greatest challenge of this millennium the growing chasm between the rich and the poor. Mr. President, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you and your colleagues today. I believe that they are re relevant to what still we need in my nation, here in the Mediterranean, and throughout the planet that we all share. Catalans are known for their ability to work hard and effectively let us do it together. Thank you very much. <laughs>